Right, it's three o'clock, so I'll, uh, I'll make a start. Thanks everyone for coming along today. And uh, thanks for uh, all the behind the scenes people organizing developer, developer, developer conference. It's great that it managed to go ahead uh, despite the worst year for meeting up in history. Uh, DDD has a um, code of con conduct. Be aware of others, be open to all questions and viewpoints, tolerant of others, welcoming, respectful. Even if you don't like their question, you have to listen out for others and be kind and considerate. Um, we're supporting a fantastic resource in terms of the National Museum of Computing, so uh, uh, inspirational facility for youngsters getting into uh, computing. I've been myself, it's, um, it's, it's got a lot of my development history sitting in cabinets there. Thanks for our sponsors, uh, without which uh, we wouldn't be able to go ahead. Black Marble particularly and all the volunteers from Black Marble, Microsoft, Sage, NDC, Landmark, Grey Matter, IO and the University of Hull. Hopefully we'll be all meeting face to face next year. Uh, please tweet out, um, do you, you've come to my talk. Uh, I'd love to see, get some feedback on Twitter. Um, I'm at John Staveley, but you can also tweet in at Developer Day and DDD 2020 and everyone enjoy the day. So my name is John Stavely, I'm a contractor based in the, the Leeds area. There's some collection information. Um, my talk today is guaranteeing application in Azure security with DevSecOps. Now originally this was a, a 90 minute talk and I'm going to attempt to shoehorn it into 45 minutes. Um, there are longer versions on, are on YouTube you can possibly find, um, but I'm going to do my best today. But you might find uh, with sections I skip over them. So DevSecOps is what I call pull left security. You're, you're doing everything as early in the life cycle, uh, development life cycle as possible. And I'll be talking more about that as we go through. Amplifying security feedback. So at all stages, the feedback you get from your security test is feeding back into your development process. So you can uh, become more and more secure as you go over the time. Uh, one of the things we use in DevSecOps is an overall enhanced security baseline. So what does that mean is, is you don't just do file new project, you take file new, the most secure project I could manage the last time that I was uh, developing and, and secure by default. So uh, all the security options are switched on by default and turned off by exception if you absolutely need to. And you know, with DevOps, so we're doing reproducible deployments. We're using Azure DevOps as our build and deployment pipeline, uh, using ARM templates to build up our platform in terms of Azure. So also what we're going to look at today is going to do some a very lightweight threat modeling, um, checks in the IDE, what security checks you can do there, static analysis. So this is about outside in, looking at code, looking at the, the platform setup, the components you're using in your in your system and then security unit tests feeding security back in and then outside in so dynamic analysis and tons of OWASP SAP and security acceptance tests. Um, all of the code is on GitHub. Now in the longer presentation I'd make lots of ref I'd talk through the code and so you could see um, where it was where all of this security was being enforced as you as you went through the build pipeline but I'm going to just skip through that and I'm just going to say the code is on GitHub Go and steal it, it's all free. And my slides are on SlideShare. I hope that uh, DDD are gonna tweet out my slides uh, later on. Uh, so why security? Basically, uh, if you don't, you're gonna get fined, you're gonna lose your pension, um, you, you lose your corporate image. There are lots, lots of reasons with pound signs in front of it, why you'd wanna care about security. And how do we approach security? Well, DevSecOps, um, it's a very fancy term, but it's just DevOps with uh, automated deployments uh, and build uh, with a bit of a focus on security. So a fast flow of work from Dev to Ops, you check in, it builds, it does all your tests and then automatically deploys and uh, so the Ops can uh, operate it. Amplifying security feedback, as I mentioned, uh, and improvement of daily security work. So you're understanding, you're, you're getting all the tests and it's feeding back into how you work to say, so uh, over time, you're getting more and more better habits in terms of building security into your system, working with secure default code and platform. So what I mean by pull left. So if you have a look by a, a traditional waterfall um, development process, you've got requirements, design, coding, testing, hardening and production. 
uh, you, you're doing as much as you can on the left side of that than the right side. If you think of like a, a small agile sprint, you're doing or a, a user story, you're doing the requirements. How much security can you capture in the requirements phase, in the design phase, in the coding, testing, and, and hardening phase? So SCUD by default means fewer security defects stand on the, the shoulders of giants uh, and learn from the mistakes they've made. You reduce the average time to detect a security uh, issue and you can feed it forward because you're doing automated deployments. You, once you've spotted something, you can push it out to production quickly. Uh, yeah, and then automation provides deployment of security updates quicker. And, and studies have shown that um, it provides a moving target to hackers. So because you're deploying all the time, it's more difficult for them to get a foothold in your system and understand how your system works. And of course, fixing a problem in production is six times is times more expensive than fixing a design. So the earlier you, you find an issue by pulling it left, the better it is for your bottom line. So what we're going to secure. So a couple of years ago, I did a security talk. And again, to illustrate all of these security concepts, it's all about application security. So basically taking OWASP top 10 and putting it in the code. So how to combat SQL injection, cross-site scripting, um, uh, encrypting the traffic and the data at rest uh, and in transit, cross-site request forgery. So I did this big project, um, which is now on GitHub. So it's kind of like file new, new application project uh, with all the security switched on. Um, so I, then I've just built the DevSecOps uh, automated uh, security checks on top of that. Uh, so what it consists of is you've got um, an, an app service, so a, a website which communicates to a key vault full of your secrets, a SQL database for your assets, some blob storage with a, a, a Cloudflare firewall, which I consider best of class in between the internet and your app service, and then you've got your paying user or your nefarious actor trying to get at it. So all the demo code is on GitHub, uh, John Stavely slash security essentials. It uses infrastructure as code, so it automates the platform setup using an ARM template. Um, the Cloudflare setup is done using PowerShell, so it just hits their, their API and it enforces uh, TLS, HTTP2, the web application firewall, which prote uh, protects against another service, SQL injection tax, and many other. It locks down access to the Azure App Service the Cloudflare, so the app service can't talk to the outside world, they're going to talk to Cloudflare. You've got the Azure Key Vault to protect secrets, uh, virtual network to secure um, access to assets, so the, the blobs can't talk to any other part of the internet other than your app service. And then in terms of blob storage, so storage you've got encryption at rest and transit, uh, and, and um, the database, transparent data encryption. So you got our best of class, um, all these security um, switches switched on and um, so your platform is is quite hardened um, so if you haven't seen uh, an arm template before this is how we deploy uh, all of the code uh, the, the platform into the internet and you've just got a json uh, script like this and so if you take the SQL server it says well I'm a SQL server and, and I've got this this login you, which is taken from Key Vault and I've set up these firewall rules and audit settings and the like so you take this big blob of JSON it fires it at Azure and it turns switches on all of the security settings and then uh, it's deployed using Azure pipelines so here you've got uh, one I did earlier uh, so this is deployed onto the internet Uh, it takes a, a YAML file, um, so this is the build phase uh, and it's doing all the security checks as you're going along. So uh, that's how that's how you're deploying it. So why automate? So I mean, I've got a, an environment I use just for security testing, but uh, if you've got a parameterized platform that you can deploy to anywhere, you can have you can bring up a QA, QA environment, a UAT environment, a pen test environment, 
at a moment's notice uh, just by creating a different set of parameters rather than someone going through a 200 step install script. What that means is your CI CD pipeline is your heart of security. So when you check in and it does the build and all security checks, it enforces those rules and audits the build and deployment changes. So uh, you need to secure access to that build pipeline in Azure DevOps. And of course it enforces all the security rules. Um, right, so I'm going to skip this bit, but uh, it, it shows you, what I'm going to show you here is how the secrets are stored in Azure DevOps. So you've got pass, it's got a way of storing passwords, uh, and there's also a way of installing uh, extensions from the marketplace. You, it's a couple of clicks, and then you can install, for instance, the OWASP penetration testing tool uh, and point it in your application. So what my Azure Pipelines does is fairly standard. Uh, so I showed you the YAML file, but it, it's basically doing this. It does NuGet, install, build and package, security tests, and then does loads of security testing. So once it's passed all of that, that takes about seven, mi uh, seven minutes all said. It then uh, sets up the infrastructure in Azure, sets up the firewall in Cloudflare, deploys my code to that server, and then runs the acceptance tests and does dynamic analysis using OWASP SAP. So this diagram is taken from a uh, uh, great book by John Baird on DevSecOps, which I think is like the best resource out there. I'll give a link to that later. Um, so here you check in code and then it goes into the repo, it gets built, produces binaries, gets deployed, acceptance tests and then gets deployed to production. So at each of these stages, you can do different types of security tests. So here before you've done any, any commits, you can do threat modeling and IDE checks. Uh, and then continuous integration uh, and deployment. So I'm going to go through each of those stages one by one. So we're going to do some lightweight th threat modeling. So this isn't a bureaucratic process where you convene a team for 90 minutes. This is really sort of the lightweight end of things, um, but it's surprising how many people don't do this given the dividends you can get. So when the code is designed, as we do in the Agile process, where do you catch security problems in the design? What if you're using a technology you're not familiar with and um, how do you know you're configuring it in the most secure way? Well, Microsoft has create, created a, a threat modeling tool, uh, the link to which is below, and it categorizes different threats according to the stride model. So spoofing, that's pretending to be someone or something you're not, as you'd get in a cross-site request forgery attack. Tampering, sniffing or changing something at rest in memory on transit, so that could be SQL injection or a TLS bypass. Repudiation, doing something and then denying you did it. I, you know, if you don't have sufficient logging in your application that said uh, a user tried to log on with 6,000 different passwords. Uh, information disclosure, giving some information to an authorized person as you'd get in a man in the middle attack. Denial of service and elevation of privilege, doing something you're not authorised to do, for instance, via an object reference. If you don't know what that is, I'd recommend the awards top 10. So Microsoft have done a, a, the threat modelling tool with a really good Azure template. So if you're an Azure user as I am, you can drag all your Azure, Azure assets onto it um, and then see what the threats are according to that stride model. OK, so here is the system we saw earlier. So here we've got a user talking to a browser and the browser talking to the firewall and the firewall talking to the app service and then the database, the key vault and blob storage. Um, so we do this when uh, occasionally, uh, like when, when you're doing introducing a new technology, we, want, we might consider doing this. Um, or if you've got uh, an application you, that's never had any kind of threat modeling, you might do this to understand it. Now, it took me about an hour with all fiddling around with all different wires on this diagram to get this set up. And what it does is it then gives you this useful stride model. So if we have a look at this one here, an adversary, an adversary can fingerprint an Azure Web Application or API by leveraging server head information. So this threat occurs between the firewall and the Azure App Service. You can see it's highlighted there. So the stride category is information disclosure. And uh, the, it's given you some mitigation. So remove standard headers to avoid fingerprinting and then some really useful links that you can then uh, look up. 
uh, so I've said, well, this is this is mitigated, and the, my justification is that server headers have been removed from uh, by code using HTTP headers.cs. If you look in the the source code. So another example, uh, and obviously you can read confidential data due to weak connection string configuration. Again, that's during the app service and so database information disclosure. Um, possible mitigations are there and I've mitigated by in applying encryption equals true and trusted service certificate equals false. Now, let's say I'm doing a, uh, I'm pursuing CV dri driven development and I would like to, uh, okay, this wasn't showing earlier. Let's say I'm doing, I want Azure Redis cache. So I want to, I'm going to dump in an Azure Redis cache. I've never used Azure Redis cache before, but I want to model security that. And then I'll do some requests. So my app service will then talk to the Azure Redis cache. Now, if you look at the bottom here, it's got a whole new set of uh, threats. An adversary can read sensitive data by sniffing traffic to Azure Redis Cache. Possible mitigations, ensure the communication to Azure Redis Cache is over to CSL TLS. Configure Azure Redis Cache. Right, so bear in mind I've never used it before. I've got a step up to understanding what I need to do to, uh, to secure it by setting secure defaults. And that's taken literally minutes to come up with. Um, so IDE checks, I mean, I'm going to I skate over this because uh, I think this is the weak end of the wedge, really. There's there's very little. Uh, I find the checks they do uh, in the browser to not, not be very good. Um, it's mostly done on pattern matching um, rather than the rigorous identif uh, identification of all the codes and source through codes. So a good IDE check will obviously integrate with the IDE, but you can also enforce the rules at Azure DevOps. So if a developer chooses to ignore something in their local system, it can fail it on the build as well. You can allow building of your own rules if you have particular security requirements, have a low false positive rate, so you're not wasting a lot of time switching things off all the time, and give code examples and extra tutorials to fix things, and able to define exclusions to the inevitable uh, false positives you get. Um, so there are a few out there. DevSkim uh, I have used, which you can pick up insecure hash and encryption algorithms, insecure URLs, secure credentials and code. Um, I wouldn't particularly rate it because it, again, it's doing a lot of pattern matching. So if you do HTTP colon slash slash in a note, it will say I'm oh, using an insecure reference. Well, yeah, it's OK, but I'm, this is just a note. I'm not actually attack. I'm not actually going to this URL. But the, uh, you, you get what you pay for and PumaScan Viracode are uh, more expensive versions and provide better facilities. OK, so once you've checked in, you've done your design, you've done, done uh, you understand uh, this the threat modeling and the checks in the ID, then you go into continuous integration. So at this stage, you do static and uh, static testing, component analysis and unit security unit tests. So what we're going to look at in this section is FX COP, so some code analyzers, Sona Cloud, um, Microsoft Security Code Analysis, and the ARM Template Checker to test our platform. So FX COP it tests are for a load of stuff, not just security. Code quality, design flaws, globalization rules, portability, reliability, etc., and of course security. So in terms of what the, the security flaws it can catch, it can insecure SQL, secure, insecure class design, um, data type definition processing, anti forgery tokens missing, weak cryptography algorithms, et cetera, et cetera, lots more. Um, so what you do to get this, you install this package called FX Cop Analyzers. And uh, in here, you need a version which matches your build agent, otherwise it won't run on the, uh, once you check in. OK, so once I've installed the package, I get rule sets like this. So if I have a look at the security enabled uh, rule sets. Let's 
So I grab this rule set and I copy it to the bottom of my project and I get something that looks like this. So here it's checking for an LDAP injection vulnerability and if it finds it, it will mark my code as warning. But it's very easy just to change that to error, in which case it will fail the build um, either locally or uh, on the server. Now you're not you're not building that as part of your um, your build pipeline where you are, you are building, but you're not deploying it, so it's marked as a, a dev dependency. So there are loads and loads of different rules which they uh, update all the time um, about security. So for instance, if I was to um, use a SHA-1 managed uh, encryption algorithm, hashing algorithm as part of my code, I'd get like a, uh, a yellow squiggly under the code that says um, yeah, this is bad, this is bad what you're doing here and then it could fail the build if you chose to. Um, so Sony Cloud, uh, I described as Sony Cued as a service, so again it's lots of code quality tests. SonyCloud.io so it shows what's wrong and how to put it right. It shows you bugs, security vulnerabilities. Again, lots and lots of other things in valid CSS, deprecated HTML, performance issues, code duplication. Uh, it's free for open source projects like the one I'm using at the moment. Uh, analyzes where bugs are clustered, um, whether Friday afternoon is a, is a bad time for checking in code because you produce a lot of bugs on a Friday afternoon, or all, all that kind of stuff. Um, so. I can take it as read that I just put in a couple of steps in Azure Pipeline. So I add in the Sona Cloud uh, template into my Azure Pipelines and then, then configure it to point to my Sona Cloud project. So here it is. So uh, this happens on every check in, on every build. So it pushes my code out to Sona Cloud that does uh, all of these checks. So fortunately, quality gate is passed this time, but it's telling me that I've got one security vulnerability, 568 code smells. Oh my goodness, that's very smelly code. Um, bit of technical debt, bit of duplicated code. So let's have a look at that security vulnerability. Refactor this code to not perform redirects based on tainted user control data. What on earth is this about then? So if I click on that, it gives me a detailed explanation and some example code. Uh, about. But here is my code that I've checked in. So it's all about uh, the entry point is log on async and this return URL parameter is important. So it's going, oh, it passes through here, it's rect GRL, and this is this is where the redirect might pass an insecure reference. So I need to check that in, in some way. So it's provided real actionable steps as to uh, how I can fix a problem. So Microsoft have come up uh, with a whole set of security tools you can use as part of Azure DevOps. So this is part of the, the paying suite that I've uh, highlighted on the right here. It's got credential scanner. So um, this is where obviously it's bad practice to check in any kind of credentials or, or encryption strings, certificates, secrets, or sensitive comment, uh, content. So this can be checked in your source code and your build output. Includes 25 different searches supporting 70 plus file types. So what you get, again, as part of the Azure DevOps build pipeline, you just add the task in and it spits out as one of your deliverables, um, a file like this. So saying web.live.config uh, has a found a password symmetric key or storage credential so if you want you can again get it to, to fail the build um, and obviously you'll need to change the password so it does a whole lot of other check, security checks as well ts lint uh, you can run this outside of mcsa obviously um, it can checks for no eval no band terms no string based timeouts and enforces use strict and that kind of thing but this, this, it, it, they package this as part of uh, Azure DevOps. And it's also got the Rosalind analyzers that can run on and Azure DevOps as well and it can produce a report and use break the build if required so you can also watch your security foot line 
uh, footprint as you as you go over time as well. Um, is a little pricey if you're a small organization, so you'd need unified advanced tier support or pay a partner $7,500 per year or $5,000 per Azure DevOps organization. But once you've got an Azure DevOps organization, you're paid for the entire organization. Um, so you have as many builds in there as you want. So AZSK is a tool set for checking the platform so you can run checks against the resource group, ARM template, Azure subscription, continuous assurance and monitoring and provides monitoring and telemetry as well. I've only used the top two in that and it's constantly updated. So here's one I ran earlier. So you've sold the ARM template that I created earlier. So the website that Jason creates says this is the Azure assets that I want. These are my live parameters. So I just run this um, and it will spit out this file here, which I suppose is easier to see uh, here because it's got red as failed and green as passed. So uh, it's saying that I should, for my app service, I should use AAD at, uh, authentication for client service. And I should enable soft delete for this storage. So it's comparing what I've deployed to a set of security best practices. And again, you can have that as part of the build pipeline. And if there's too many failures, um, uh, it will fail the build for you. And you can have an exclusion class like, you say, well, OK, I don't use a uh, Azure Active Directory for um, securing my SQL databases. So I can exclude that one and make sure that that's not treated as a failure. Uh, so it's got resource group and ARM template checks, so you can point it against the resource group. So if, you, if you've set up your uh, your resource group manually, you can just point to that and go, well, uh, compare my resource group against rest, best practice and then tell me what, the diff what I've got to do to make good. Uh, and it could also give you a script that will then, uh, you, a PowerShell script that will then make the changes for you. So you just need to run that PowerShell script against the resource group and it will turn all the security on. So for an app service, it will enforce HTTPS only, HTTP2, uh, access controls configured, the SSL binding set correctly, WebSockets disabled, FTP disabled, all those kind of secure defaults that um, uh, you'd, you'd expect to see but aren't actually on by default. For blob storage, that it's locked down to virtual network with HTTPS access, calls not overly permissive, and that kind of thing. Right, so I've shown you the second of those demos, but I'm going to skip over the first. So now we're looking at software component analysis and I use uh, OWASP dependency check for this. Um, but you also got white source, source bot. Again, that's in my Azure pipeline. Both are in my Azure pipeline, so you can have a look at the code. You need to do those on every check-in. So here's, here's one I ran earlier. So you download, download OWASP dependency check and uh, you run this bat file. You say scan this directory here. That's where my security essentials project is. Here's my suppression file. These are the ones I know to be false positives and give it this project name. And then it downloads a load of updates and then it uh, it runs its tests. So here it's found it's run retire.js and it's found uh, lots of vulnerabilities. But it also gives you this handy uh, report, which you can then use to show to management to justify spending time on security when you can go oh, well this the component we use has got a cross-site scripting vulnerability how about we upgrade it to the latest version so we don't get hacked um here i can see the jquery.min that's uh there's a vulnerability against that it severity is medium probably want to look at these high ones here Kendo UI, uh, so the evidence it uses that it's got authors as Telerik. Um, so it doesn't do SHA, it, do, it doesn't do hash matching because um, people build, some people build their own packages, so it, it uses other means to identify the package correctly, like version numbers, authors, and that kind of thing. So the vulnerability is uh, possible cross-site scripting attack um, due to the uh, version of JavaScript this particular component uses. So I need to go and fix that. So that runs in you know, literally a minute or so, including updates. 
So it's quite a powerful way of finding uh, vulnerabilities in your system. So you can find cross-site request cross-site request forgeries, cross-site scripting, denial of service, remote code execution, buffer overflows. Um, it does generate a lot of false positives, so you need um, a lot of manual checking uh, and maybe an exclusion file. So I've created an exclusion file, uh, which with the ones I don't think, and it's just a, a load of uh, uh, XML like this, um, which is actually generated from the, this itself. So if I go, this one is an to be excluded. There's the XML and I just copy that into my document if I've determined that that is not actually a threat to me. But it is very good um, and I have identified a lot of threats using it. Uh, so white source bolt, the same but prettier. Um, I won't, I'm going to skip over this. Uh, it does also do license risk, risks and compliance. So if you've got a particular problem with uh, GPL license, um, then this will highlight it for you. So it's got free and paid versions. The the paid versions, the, the free version is like six languages, including C sharp and JavaScript, and the paid version is 80 languages. Uh, it produces a nice report like this. And again, it shows that um, here's my CVE code, the vulnerability code against this jQuery library um, and what I need to do to fix it. Um, so finally, in terms of static analysis, it does anti-malware check. With all the checks I've done so far, um, this will uh, you can develop and still check in malware or uh, a new get package that's been malwared. So Windows Defender, um, again, you need a Windows build agent to, to run this, um, but it will run the malware checker against your code to make sure um, you haven't checked in anything you shouldn't have done. And then bin skin, so this is more sort of like WPF applications where um, binaries could have been tampered with and it checks whether those the, the compilers used were outdated and they had the most secure compiler settings. Uh, that's if like someone could could tamper with those binaries or not. So I mean unit testing, there are all sorts of checks you can do um, at unit testing level. So some of the ones I've used in the past uh, that checks the hashing and encryption algorithms uh, work and uh, you know are yeah, the encryption is reversible and um, it provides um, something that's not the original string that you're encrypting, checks the email templates contain phishing warning, uh, and then loads of tests around the account creation and password reset process to show that that's robust, that's on the OWASP top 10. Netflix has done things like hashing, hashing important code, so like the auth authorization and finance uh, algorithms, uh, and then if they if developers change them in any way uh, for a good or uh, not so good reason, then security are informed of that so they can do a, a compulsory code review. And you can also check that the correct authentication applies to controllers. So down here, so when controller created, then is decorated with authorized and roles. So just reflection over, it checks for this attribute here um, on a controller. And this one goes to all of the uh, MVC controllers uh, apart from that one and checks that uh, it has been decorated with the anti forgery token. That's to mitigate a cross site request forgery. So a developer might get forgetful on a particular day and check something in, and this will remind them immediately that they need to fix it. OK, so we now have binaries and we're thinking about. Uh, and we've de deployed it, so now we can do, think about doing dynamic scans, outside in scans and security acceptance tests. So here I'd talk you through the code that we've got. I'm just going to refer you to GitHub if you want to um, understand what's going on there. You just need to understand that uh, the deployment pipeline configures everything and does configures all the security checks as well. Um, so OWASP SAP, I'd see this sort of, I describe this sort of pen test light. Um, it can check all sorts of things. It can do fuzzing, it can do, uh, it's got a, a very new cross-site scripting library, uh, content security policies. It can check for a directory traversal attack, do port scanning, attack web sockets, check for information disclosure, SQL injection, um, lots and lots of good stuff. It's definitely not a full pen test. You know, you need those security professionals bring a whole layer on top of this. Um, but my view is that you should be looking at something like this first and then getting the 
uh, security professional on to check your code afterwards. So if you haven't seen it or sat before, it looks something like this. Um, so here I've got a context defined and that tells OAuth SAP about um, the diff, uh, my application. So I say, well, include anything in the URL security essentials and I exclude all of these things that I link to that aren't relevant. And I give it some clues that it's built on SQL Server and it's built with JavaScript. So it doesn't try and do, for instance, Ruby attacks on my code. It's, it's waste. That would just be a waste of time. I teach it how to authenticate. So I log in on this page and I um, the pattern that it should look for to show that I'm logged in and, and logged out are these. And I give it some users, uh, an admin user, and a normal user. I then put in the URL and I hit attack. It then creates 10 minutes later, it gives you something like this, a whole list of vulnerabilities. OK, so this is my ZAP scanning report. Uh, so fortunately, I've got no high level vulnerabilities, media and five medium and seven low. Uh, so here it's saying I should, I'm saying something about my proxy. I'm going through Cloudflare, maybe I shouldn't. And then content security policy vulnerabilities. It's saying don't use unsafe inline. Uh, yes, like yeah, it's that it's that old grid component I'm using. I really need to get rid of that. So that would improve my content security policy score. Again, unsafe inline. Uh, cookie settings, cookie without secure flag, caching settings. Uh, it's giving me some useful useful bits of information. With all of these tools. You know, there is a Venn diagram and there is some crossover between all of them, but at each stage it's giving you a much clearer understanding of your sec your security position. Uh, so it, it's worth doing all of them. One developer said to me once that he prefers to do it all in the ID. I go, well, yeah, but you can't do a penetration test within the ID. You know, you need, a, you need deployed code and then uh, the, the security is a uh, function of the platform you're sitting on as well. So you can have to take my word for it that's configured in uh, Azure pipelines and DevOps. So you can do some security exception tests uh, on top of this as well. So you can do anti uh, validate your anti throttling work. So if you hit the login page with five different um, bad passwords for a username within a minute, it, it stops you from uh, even accessing the page. You can check that the correct HTTP headers are returned. The account process is enforced against that. Again, that's important in the OS top 10. Content security policy and security policy violations are logged correctly. And the user registering with a pwned password will be shown a warning. So Security Central Project's got a, um, it talks to Troy Hunt, have I been pwned website? And if the user logs in with a particularly bad password, it'll just give them a warning saying, uh, this password was in this breach. Um, we don't have your password, but you might think about changing it. So an, as an example, so this security test, again, this is in the source code is our spec flow test. I'll attempt to log on, put in a rubbish password, log on again, blah, blah, blah. blah. Few, few attempts later, an error message is shown. You've requested this resource too many times in the last 60 seconds. So it, it prevents a brute force attack and you've got an acceptance test to prove that. So We've now got deployed code and we've gone through um, dynamic analysis and we're pushing it into production. So we should, as part of the uh, CIA confidentiality, uh, integrity and availability, the availability part of that is uh, the monitoring. So as part of the ARM template, we deploy a monitoring. Test that to show that our system is 100% available. Then once you're in um, Azure itself, Azure then feeds back a lot of useful security information. So this is kind of a, um, uh, a combination of static analysis of what you've got deployed, as you might get with AZSK, but it, it's more than that. It's also how you use it. So you can get you access the Azure Security Center to get alerts and recommendations for our Azure resources and the subscription. So it helps with securing Transparent data encryption, auditing settings correctly, diagnostic logs enabled, uh, calls not too permissive, 
Encryption, denial of service, two-factor authentication for your subscription and your accounts, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I'll just show you that. So the security center is for all of your assets you got in the cloud. And it gives you these recommendations here and a secure score. So if I drill into that, it's saying I've done, completed 28 out of 34 recommendations and then I've got these ones I still need to do some action on. Here I've got to remediate vulnerabilities, manage access and permissions, apply data classification to my deployed data and this is uh, this is where it'll go line by line through my database and go, this looks like a credit card, this looks like a password, this looks like a username, uh, and then it, you can log, you can categorize that information and then log it. So it, this is something that's not done at any other stage. Encrypting data in transit, checks in all the way. Um, if you've got VMs, so you can do the kind of same thing with a deployed VM and uh, it just requires that there's an Azure agent installed on the VM so it can gain access to those settings there. Uh, so for each of your assets, so you've got vulnerability scans. So I'm going to skip over this quickly. Uh, so for instance, my database uh, would have this security assessment. So I, it scanned one database and I've got five failing checks on it and 45 pass checks. Um, and it, it does that on a periodic basis, so every week. So uh, as I'm deploying code to it and the, the fields in the database are changing and people are accessing the database uh, directly or indirectly, it's doing it, it's scanning all of uh, all of this activity and providing you a, a moving update. So what it can check on, so in cl classification of sensitive data, uh, correct setting of database owners, tracking and restricting setting of firewalls, guest user enable, uh, all, the, all this kind of thing. So some things we not talk, talked about today, but are quite important. Um, is well bypassing the uh, when your your build pipeline and your platform like the, the backbone of your security, you really need to secure access to the portal so that you nefarious actors can't bypass any of the checks that are enforced during your build pipeline and Azure DevOps. Uh, and a good way of doing that is using two-factor authentication using Microsoft Authenticator. So we've been doing that in our company for you know, over a year and it's, uh, it pretty much, it, AWS said, well, as soon as we inf implemented two-factor authentication and hacking just went away. So, and then beyond that, you know, it, there's users who can see the, the CI CD pipeline, but there's also those who can edit it and we do don't want them to have non-audited -audited editing to that. So then secure who, who gets access to the pipeline. Um, in terms of the Azure, uh, the, the DevOps report from this year, one of the most powerful ways for enforcing security was just plain code reviews. It's just getting another developer to check over your code and saying, you know, is this the most secure? So we talked about feed, uh, feedback um, of security and pen tests are a really powerful way of doing that is that you, when you find a vulnerability as part of your pen test, you, you, you feed that back and you go, well, how could I check, how could I have found that defect at the design stage, at the build stage, at the coding stage, at the what tests can I use to check that, that I don't have that security regression? So that's all, that's all feeding back into how you approach security but you should still definitely do a pen test as well. So in summary, my goodness, I've managed to keep it to 45 minutes. That's incredible. Um, secure by default means few security defects. Take an ARM template that has been checked and validated for uh, a good security baseline before and use that, for instance, or use code like the Security Central project that has been rigorously tested for security. Automated deployments means security defects can be fixed faster. You, you can roll forward. You can find a component that has got a vulnerability and the vulnerability has just been zero dayed and then fix it and roll it forward into production rapidly. Faster deployments means um, it's more difficult to get hacked. You can pick out security at the design stage, so lightweight threat modeling um, and IDE checks. Pull left security, identify security defects. So yeah, as we've covered, static analysis. So the, code, the tools we used there were 
FX COP, uh, which enforces certain rules, Sonar Cloud, which gives you good examples of how to fix your code, AZSK to, to test your, your platform code, and then the Microsoft Credential Scanner and TS Lint. <coughs> Excuse me. And component component analysis. So I uh, use OWASP dependency check, which I find really powerful. But Y source Bolt is also a good tool. And then bin skim if you're doing deliver delivered binaries. Dynamic testing using OWASP Zap, and then security acceptance test to check that you don't have security regressions. Then once you're in production, uh, you ensure your uh, your software is available by monitoring it constantly. You use Azure Security Center to to gain security insights into what's deployed and then feed that back into uh, jobs in your development process. You've got continuous vulnerability scans or for instance SQL Azure then also give you checks that you need you need to feed into your development. I would stress that no one tool is a silver bullet. Each has its own specialties. You don't want to rely on IDE checks or you don't want to rely on OSAP. zap. I've found putting this together, every single tool provided a different insight into my code that was really valuable. So there are some resources. Um, the book I referred to earlier, Dev, DevOpsSec uh, or DevSecOps, however you want to call it, uh, by Jim Bird. Uh, that's a really good book and uh, what I base this talk on. And then some plural site courses on some of the tools we covered, like AZSK and OWASP Zap. Um, the Azure Security Best Practices document um, is, is really good and really well written, um, uh, quite a good read. Um, and then the Unicorn Project by Gene Kim is sort of DevOps book and it's got quite a good security case study about uh, obviously how not to do security. <coughs>